Hey everybody, welcome to Belong Church. We're so glad that you're here with us this weekend. And I'm telling you, I was had the opportunity to be in Sarasota, Florida last week and sat through a message at Bayside Community Church. And they're an art church. In fact, they're art church, art church number one. Pastor Chris was told to pay it forward. And the first church that they paid it forward was to actually launch Bayside. And so I got to sit through a wonderful service, actually at the facility that we had been in Florida for many, many years. And the message was just out of this world. And it really just fell hand in hand with what we talked about last week of our anniversary. And it was talking about their anniversary. So you're going to hear some things that are similar, and, but it's just specific to them. That's all right. But it's just great. We're celebrating them having 19 years as a church in that community. But I asked for special permission from Pastor Randy Bazette because I wanted everyone to hear the message that he had. And so here you go. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys? Why don't you turn to somebody around you, whatever location you're at, or those of you online, and give some knuckles like that to somebody and say, I'm glad you're here today. It's great to have you guys. Of course, we have those, as I said, watching online and all over the, uh, really watching online all over the country and literally around the world, people are joining us, all of our locations. Isn't it cool to know that we're, we're one church, but we kind of are all over the place helping people connect with God. Would you do me a favor? Let's welcome the rest of our family. Good to have you with us. In fact, some of our family uh, right now, uh, they're in Louisiana uh, because they're doing some hurricane relief. And so uh, I'm so thankful that happens through your generosity and teams of people are going every week, Thursday to Sunday, just going over there and helping and doing some cleanup and doing some work. And all of those things happen because of your generosity. In fact, all the things we're doing this entire month uh, by loving our city, just doing some outreaches and showing the love of God. Let me just tell you something. The best part about this church is not even what happens on the weekend. I know you're like, well, you're such a great preacher, Pastor Andy. I don't know about that. <laughs> no, the best part of this church, I promise you, it happens Monday to Saturday. And I'm just so thankful. You guys get it. And so can we give God some praise for what he's doing through our church, really, in this community, in parts like Louisiana and around the world? Come on, give God some praise for what he's doing. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're in this series called Phobia. We're dealing with fears. I pray that you have been a part. If you have missed for any reason or perhaps you're new, I would encourage you to go back and watch the past messages. You can do it on our website. We have a YouTube channel. And the reason why it's so important is even though these are standalone messages, there's a lot about what we've been teaching regarding fear and anxiety that really is inductive. The first week, Pastor David Murphy taught, and he talked about how fear is a spirit. We're not talking about being afraid of something like a normal fear, afraid of snakes, or as you guys heard last week, my fear of cockroaches. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I know, awful. But, but, but it's when those things that go from being healthy to toxic, uh, when it controls our life, that's the spirit of fear. Here's our theme verse for this whole series. They're gonna put it up on the screen. It says in 2 Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Everybody stop right there. I want you to write that in the top of your notes, wherever you're taking notes right now, because you have to get this concept. We're dealing with a spiritual thing here. It's a spirit of fear. So we're attacking this through spiritual principles. And so, but God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a, a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. And so that was week one. Last week, we talked about fear of man. Ooh, that was a great service. I'm just saying, the whole service, everything was set up. We did some worship in God. How many of you, it, it would just say last week, you felt like God did something in your spirit and kind of turned you around in spirit of fear. Now you're living in a spirit of faith. Come on, won't you praise God wherever you are right now if that happened? 
If you, if you missed either one of those weeks, I would encourage you to, to, as I said, go and watch those. We're gonna continue the series this week, and uh, then we're gonna close it out uh, next week. And so this week, I'm gonna be dealing with fear of failure. How many of you just love to fail at something? <laughs> of course not, okay. None of us do. So I wanna attack this from a spiritual standpoint, and how can we not let fear control us, but how can we live with faith? over the problems and the circumstances that are in front of us or surrounding us or behind us, whether they're in our minds or our emotions or whether they're real. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Would you close your eyes? Would you turn your heart and your attention to the Lord right now? God, I just pray for those that are a part of this service. I pray that we would receive your word today. God, with everything, I pray that it goes out with great power and demonstration to set people free in Jesus' name. God, let us not think that circumstances are greater or bigger than you, but God, give us eyes of faith to see, God, that no matter what, you are bigger than anything. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right, so you already got your notes out or however you're taking notes, your smart device or the notes that you were given. Would you write this? Everyone fails. Everybody does. We all fail. Now, I'm not saying we like it, but even though we all are accustomed to failing, and I don't mean that just because we're failures, that's actually the very opposite. That's what the devil would want you to understand. He'd want you to associate with making a mistake or having a fail, making you a failure. But I can tell you right now, you aren't what you've done. God sees you in a different light. Come on, somebody, in Jesus' name. Y'all gonna help me out today. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. God doesn't look at your mistakes. He only wants to see the direction that you're facing right now. But this is an epidemic, like a problem in our culture. We, we wanna do everything we can to protect our kids from failing. I mean, we have these non-competitive sports leagues. Because we, we wanna build our kids' esteem and let them know that no matter what, you're always a winner. That is not life. <laughs> winning doesn't make you stronger failing does as long as you get back up and do it again let me let me read this quote real quick this is winston churchill oh man this is great where is it okay he said success is not final failure is not final it is the courage to continue that counts I'm praying today that there's a courage, there is a faith in you that says, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna keep going. It doesn't matter what happens in life. The best thing we can do to teach our kids or for us to learn in general is it doesn't matter when you make a mistake. It only matters how you respond to that mistake. I remember teaching our kids early on, just do your best. That's what matters. Are you giving it your best? It's not the grade, it's not whether you struck out at the plate, it's none of those things, it's just did you give your best? Did you give your best with the abilities that you have? And you're gonna make a mistake. I try to teach my kids, look, you in my gene pool, you, <laughs> you just better get accustomed to making mistakes. You gotta learn how to keep going even when you make a mistake. I'll never forget one of our kids, he, he was pretty young, he's like eight years old or something like that, and, he like was in the house and decided he was gonna go out to the swimming pool. And so he's gonna go out as fast as he can to the swimming pool, but he didn't realize that the sliding glass door was closed. That shows you my wife's an incredible cleaner. Isn't that right? Yeah. No streaks, man, just cleaning. He whacked the glass. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. Well, I first like, are you okay? And he was like, he wasn't physically hurt, but he was like, his pride was hurt, you know what I mean? And I started laughing so hard. Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> like the, the, he was just drinking something and it was running down the glass door, you know? <laughs> and he was mad at me, Dad, don't laugh at me. I was like, son, that's funny. <laughs> and you're gonna have to learn how to laugh at yourself because you're gonna be doing stupid stuff like that your whole life, you're welcome. Why do we take ourselves so serious? You know what, even the best people that we admire and look up to, they fail. I mean, you think about people that get paid millions and millions of dollars to be a professional athlete, the NBA. I mean, 50% of their shots, they don't make it. <laughs> and yet they keep shooting. Listen to this quote. I've missed more than 9,000 shots. 
I've lost over 300 games. 27 times my team passed me the ball to make the game-winning shot, and I failed them. None other than Michael Jordan, MJ. Think about that. But yet, when it was game was on the line again, who did you want to have the ball? You could give the ball to MJ, man, <laughs> right? Yet, look at how many times he failed. Babe Ruth, probably the greatest baseball player that's ever lived. He had 714 home runs. He struck out 1,330 times. Nearly half the times he was at bat, he was gonna strike out and he was gonna go back to the dugout. And yet we see things like that and we say, oh man, look at, look at how, how great they were. And yet our own lives, a lot of times, we're frozen by fear and not trying because we're afraid that we're gonna fail. You probably are gonna fail about half the times you try something. But those are the moments that we a lot of times learn our greatest lessons. In fact, I would tell you that I think most of our greatest lessons we learn in life are taught through the classroom of failure. You can write that down. Most of the greatest lessons we learn in life are taught in the classroom of failure. So here's the scripture that I want you to understand. If that's gonna happen, Hebrews says, do not throw away your confidence but it will be richly rewarded. So you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Look, you're gonna make mistakes, but we've gotta learn how to live with confidence. Everybody say confidence. If you would do me a favor and turn to the book of Joshua. It's early in the Old Testament. We're gonna read it. It's book six in the Old Testament. And so if you would turn to that book, we're gonna begin to study it and we're gonna learn about someone who had a great opportunity for failure and what did he do and what can we learn from that in order to, to be successful and allow our confidence to grow when we're faced with insurmountable problems. So this was Joshua, the book of Joshua. And so let me tell you what was happening. So Joshua was, uh, was one of the Israelites that was in slavery in Egypt. So the Israelites were, you know, you guys, you guys remember the movie. How many of you are old enough to remember uh, Charleston Heston being Moses? Okay, that's the old people. Some of you. There's never been a greater Moses than Charleston Heston. I think he will actually play Moses when we get to heaven. <laughs> so they were, in, they were in slavery for some 400 years, the Israelites, they were in Egypt, and God raises up Moses. Man, that's a great person to teach on failure as well. You should, you should read the beginning of that in Exodus. You know, he... He actually was called by God to lead the Israelites out of that. And he thought, God, I'm not very any good. I'm not good at this. But God used him anyway. And he delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. And then they wandered around in the desert for 40 years because they were complaining and wanting to go back to Egypt. And then Moses dies. And now we're wondering what's going to happen. How are the Israelites not just coming out of Egypt, but how are they going to live in the promised land the land that God had promised them. I want you to understand something real quick. That this is a, a type of you and I in the New Testament. You and I were in bondage, in slavery to sin, just like the Israelites were in Egypt. And God sent us a Moses, his name is Jesus. And Jesus, come on, yeah, y'all give God some praise for sending Jesus because we didn't know. We didn't know we needed that, but, but Jesus came. And, and he delivered us from slavery by dying on the cross. He paid for the price of our sin. And so becoming a Christ follower is getting you out of Egypt, it's getting you out of slavery and out of bondage. But, but that's not all God has for you, by the way. You need to understand something. God just doesn't want you to have a ticket so you can go to heaven. God wants you to live in the promises that he has for you today. And so some of you have been wandering around in a desertous place. And maybe fear is what has kept you there. But I'm here to tell you, God wants you to not just be out of slavery. He doesn't just want you to be in a deserted place where I got my ticket to heaven. God wants you to move into the promised land and possess everything that God has for you. And many times we don't do that because we're afraid of failing. But we're gonna learn today how to overcome that and live in all that God has for us. So that's where we are in our story in Joshua chapter one. The Israelites were out of Egypt. They were in the desert. They were about to move into the promised land and Moses dies. Here we are, Joshua 1 the first couple of verses, it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, 
The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready. You're about to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. This is the promised land. And so as they're about to accomplish something, it is a great feat. It's a great opportunity for failure. Are they really ready for this? Here's the first thing I want you to know that we can learn from what we're gonna study today. It's the word perspective. You and I, when we look at our problems and we think they're too big for us, they're, they're greater than us, it's because we have the wrong perspective. We're looking at things through our eyes instead of the way that God sees things. Now, I don't know if you know this, but God is bigger than your problems. Aren't you thankful you serve a God bigger than your problems? Yes. All right, guess what? God is also bigger than your brain. Aren't you glad you serve a God bigger than your brain? Come on. You ain't got no big old brain. Let me tell you that right now. God is bigger than your brain. And I'm telling you, we oftentimes see our problems as bigger than it's like, oh, I don't know if God can do that. And that's what the Israelites, these guys were slaves. They weren't soldiers. How are we going to go and take over the land and conquer all the kings and all the enemies in this promised land? You know they had the wrong perspective on things. The odds, it was stacked against them, church. But I want you to know something. That's good. When your problems are bigger than you and you're like, I don't know, God, if I can do that, I think that's God saying, that's the plan for you. If you can accomplish it without God, it ain't big enough for you. God wants you to do things that are bigger than what you can accomplish on your own. I think you need to be at the place where you're like, oh, Lord, if you don't show up, I'm going to fail miserably. Perfect. <laughs> if you can do it on your own, you don't need God. And if you don't need God, it isn't God's plan. So we have to get to the place where we're like, God, this is way bigger than you. In fact, look what Jesus said. Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. I want you to look at this, this slide. With man, it's impossible. Look, if God is calling you to do something that is impossible for you to do, I want you to know it's God. God wants you to dream big. He wants you to have big vision. He wants you to have big goals, and he wants to do big things in your life. And if it's bigger than you, then I would submit to you that is God. So what we have to do is separate ourselves and our circumstances from God because God says, I'm possible. And there's a big difference. You're gonna say it's impossible, but God's gonna say, I'm possible. All things are possible through him. Come on, y'all give God some praise if you believe that it's possible with him. I just was thinking, that's our birthday, you know, we're turning 19 years old, and uh, so I figured let's party the whole month. But I remember some 19 years ago, in fact, a little over 19 years ago when Amy and I moved to this community, and I thought, God, I, I don't know. I, I felt him calling me to start this church. I knew that he did, but this was impossible. I mean, I have never been the lead pastor of a church before. I've been in ministry since 1993. But God, I've never been the point person. This is, I can't do this. I'm, I probably felt like Joshua. Like, God, I've seen other people that are like Moses. They are like big time leaders and that's not me. God, that's too big for me. I can't do that. And God was like, Randy, your focus is on the wrong person. It's not about you. It's not about anybody else. This is about me. It may be impossible for you, but God says I'm possible. So why don't you trust me? And I think when we get in over our head, look, if you're in water that's over your head, it doesn't matter if it's this over your head or if it's a thousand feet over your head, it's still over your head. So you just gotta learn how to trust in God in those moments. And I just remember saying, God, I don't really know if you can do it. But he said, Randy, you got the wrong perspective. Everyone say perspective. Confidence to overcome the fear of being successful or accomplishing what God has called you to in your marriage, in your business, in your walk with the Lord, whatever it is, the first thing you have to do is you gotta get a God focus. The next thing God says is, I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever, wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. 
for I will be with you as I was with Moses. You will not fail. I like what God says. He's emphatic, is he not? I promise you, you will not fail, and I'm not gonna abandon you. So be strong and be courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land. Everybody say all. All the land that I swore to them. In other words, I'm gonna do this. This ain't about you. I promise these people that I was gonna do this. So you need to get the right perspective and you need a promise. Write that word promise down. See, God promised Joshua that he was gonna possess the land. You have to understand something that God has promises for you. And God wants us to to be in a place where we realize God wants us to possess possess some things. He wants us to accomplish things. And when God spoke to me some 19 years ago about planting this church, I just, I remember driving around this community praying, God, is this the land that you're calling me to possess? I, I never forget this moment. It's just, you know, when it gets this time of year, I'm always reminded of the journey of what God has done. I've just been reflecting on that. In fact, I was driving around. It was the February of 2002. And I was driving around in East Manatee County here, which wasn't nearly what it is in 2002. Let me just tell you, this place is cray cray. Once again, how many of y'all thankful you live in Florida? Isn't this a great place? Come on, let's give God some praise for living in this place. This is, it's kind of like the promised land. Come on, somebody, yeah. So don't mess it up. Those of you that moved here, we like it like it is. We we will put up with traffic and we'll put up with construction, but don't you dare mess up the culture that we got going on around here. So anyway, so I was driving around and I was actually at Braden River Middle School and elementary school and it was actually the time of day where the School gets out, you know, in the car lines and people picking up their kids and kids everywhere and golf carts and cars. And and I saw those people and as God spoke to me, he said, Randy, these are your people right here. There are people hurting in this community. There are people that need me. And everywhere you go, Randy, you're gonna possess this land. I'm gonna give it to you as an inheritance in Jesus' name. And can I tell you, I drive around here all the time just like, yeah, God, it's my city. Come on, in Jesus' name. We're gonna make it hard for people to go to hell, God, because you gave us this city in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody, that's a promise from God in Jesus' name. And by the way, if you came here to be in a comfortable church, I pray you're uncomfortable. Because God didn't bring you here to occupy a seat. God didn't bring you here to click a thing and watch online. God brought you here to make a difference. And if this is your church, we a difference-making church, people. And so... Look, it, maybe sometimes people come and maybe you don't even buy the Kool-Aid we selling right now and that's okay, all right? Just hang around a little bit. It'll get on you. Or maybe you've been burnt out by other churches or what. I don't know your experiences and so it's okay. Maybe you need to get healed up but I'm here to tell you at some point in time you're gonna have to quit occupying a seat and you got to get up and, and start serving other people because that's who we are, church. We live in for eternity in Jesus' name. And the vision and the culture of this church, it came from that moment in February of 2002 when God said, Randy, I want you to come here and to start this church and and you're gonna make a difference and you're gonna make it hard for people to go to hell and hurting people are gonna find healing and all of that. And I was like, okay, God, let's go. I had a promise, let's go. And then we had our very first meeting a couple of months after that. We didn't know one person in this town, not one person. And I remember I drove back again to come just hang out and meet with people. We had seven people at the meeting in the family room. Amy wasn't even there. <laughs> She's what they call a late adopter, you know what I mean? Like, she, I don't know, Randy, you go ahead, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, God, you know, this thing is gonna have to grow faster than this, so we ain't gonna make a difference with anybody. And, uh, and, but he said, Randy, I gave you a promise, you just keep walking. It might, you might see it as impossible, but I say it's possible. Just keep walking. And, uh, and we did. In fact, then we moved here in July. And we, but finding a house back then was kind of like it is now. We would look at a house and then go to our hotel room and think about it. We're gonna go look at it again the next day. Hey, we, these are the ones we go look at. I'm sorry, they're gone. That's, that's exactly the way it is right now. So, and we had a price range, and because the market was going like it was, we were like, oh, man, 
God, we, we, we're gonna have to stretch. We, where are we gonna live? And God says, don't worry, Randy, I'm possible. And so we had to take a stretch and we bought a house on faith when we didn't have any income. We were like just, we just talking about stepping on faith, but I had a promise from God. And then we started building our team and it grew all the way to 20 people. Come on, y'all, we can take the world with 20 people. Yeah, I know, don't laugh, that's okay. That's all I could do, right? And then we, we couldn't find a school to meet in. There were, there were uh, 13 churches meeting in schools in Manatee County in 2002. That's startup churches, like portable churches. 13 of them, we had three of them meeting in Lakewood Ranch High School. Brayton River High School wasn't even a thought back then. Neither was the parish community high school or whatever. It was only Lakewood Ranch High School. There were three churches meeting in there. The only middle school around here, well, Braden River Middle School had a church meeting in there. Uh, Hale Middle School, we didn't want to do church in Hale anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> but they had two churches meeting and they didn't make it. All right, so. <laughs> Literally, we couldn't find a place to meet. And three weeks before we were meeting, we walked by Bashaw Elementary School and it was like, God, this, is, this has got to be it. We were gonna walk around that thing like the Jericho, like Joshua was getting ready to do. God, give us that school in Jesus' name. Because the principal was like, you ain't meeting in here. It's like, but God, we don't have a place to meet. We're supposed to be meeting in like three weeks. We gotta like tell people where we're meeting. And we were walking around and God opened the door. Facilities manager came out, Rex Ballinger. He's on our staff right now. Yeah. He said, what are you guys doing here on church property? It was before school started. I said, what do you guys need? I said, man, we hoping to play in a church. We don't have a place to meet. He goes, I got it. Don't worry about it. And he lobbied every teacher and principal and everything and got us in that school. And then September 8th of 2002, we had 220 people come to the very first service. Come on, somebody. Praise God for that. And from September of 2002 to January of 2003 was like, talk about revival. God began to do something so powerfully, even I couldn't believe it. Because the church grew steadily from 220 people down to 87 people. So when failure's staring you in the face like that, what do you do? God, you said, we're gonna talk about that in a minute, about how do you hold on to God's promises in those moments. And, and, but, but you have to say, God, you promised, and I'm, I'm not gonna let go of this. God, you said we were gonna do great things. God, you said this church was gonna make a difference. And I'll never forget, God said, Randy, you don't worry about the outcomes, you just worry about trusting me. And I did. I said, okay, God, if that's all it is is 87 people, then I'm going to pastor these people like I'm, I'm going to be the best pastor of 87 people this community has ever had. And do you know the next week it started growing? And you just have to get to the place, no matter what your circumstances say, because circumstances and people will tell you it's impossible. But I can promise you that when God says it's possible, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, how do you believe? You just keep holding on to that thing. Come on, everybody just grab your hand like this and squeeze it tight, and you need to hold on to God's promise. Some of you are, are, are dying inside because of a marriage, a failed relationship, something with a child, or maybe an addiction, or maybe a business, or a financial thing, or maybe something's going on, and I'm here to tell you, you gotta hold on to God's promises. And I don't care what you're facing right now. Do you know that there's 365 fear knots in the Bible? That means whatever you fear in every day, there's an answer for you in Jesus' name. There's a promise that God says, fear not. Come on, give him some praise. So, God's promise. Everybody say promise. You gotta get the right perspective. It ain't about you, it's about God. You gotta hold on to his promise. And then there's this part where it's, it's, it's our responsibility. Write this word down, premise. In other words, there's a premise. There's a responsibility that you and I have. That's in essence what he told Joshua. Let's get back to our verse. God told him, he said, be strong and courageous. Some translations say fear not. Everybody say fear not. That's what you need to hear when you're holding on to God's promise and you haven't yet lived in that promised land that he's given you. And that's what God says. He says, but you need to be careful to obey. Everybody say obey. You have to obey the law that my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from the right or to the left. 
that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, notice the word then. If you do these things, then you will be prosperous and successful. I want you to write these phrases down. Obey it, say it or speak it, and then think it. That's what he's telling Joshua. He's like, listen, man, you gotta obey it. And, and a lot of times, though, this is the hard part for us. We want God to help us overcome our fears, but, but we oftentimes don't wanna obey God when he tells us to do something. I mean, we say we do. How many of you ever been to church before and you hear something and you're like, ooh, yeah, God, that's for me, and you write it down. Come on, how many of y'all ever done that before? Raise your hand. You know you heard from God in this place before. And you're like, yeah, God, that's me. That's for me. I got it. Okay, I heard it. And then you leave and you start going, well, I'm kind of busy. I can't serve. A tithing, I ain't financially, God, I do that later. You straighten out my finances, then I will. But that's not what God said. Forgive that person, even though they don't deserve it. I'm trusting you. God, I'm not gonna forgive them. And we start rationalizing away our obedience. But I'm gonna tell you something right now. The blessing is not in the hearing. The blessing is in the doing. And we have to get obedient. Yeah, come on, we have to be obedient to God's word. You know, we act like my teenagers when they were teenagers. They, I don't know if y'all have kids that don't listen. Mine listen now. Hey, did you clean your room? Huh? Are you talking to me? Do you have a room? Uh-huh. Is it dirty? Uh-huh. Well, go clean it. I didn't know you were talking to me. I thought you were talking to my brother or whatever, right? They don't, they like, they hear it, but they don't want to obey, right? Come on. They act like they can't hear, but they can hear. Now, you call them for dinner? Shoot. Before you even finish saying dinner is ready to dinner, they're at the table. We're going for ice cream. They're already in the car. You don't even have to finish it, right? They hear, but they don't obey. But I'm gonna tell you, the blessing from the parent comes from the obedience, not just in hearing me tell you to clean your room. But don't we do that? Uh, God, you told me that, but I don't think that's really for me. You must have been speaking to the person next to me and the intercept, I intercepted the message and it is not. <laughs> and don't we rationalize it away? But we have to obey we have to obey the word of the Lord. Look what Jesus said. Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So you gotta obey it. How do you do that? You gotta speak it and you gotta think it. That's why you need to know there's 7,000 promises in God's word. There's one for whatever problem you're dealing with right now. And when I say speak it, I mean you need to write it all over the place. I grew up in a home, there's scripture everywhere. I couldn't even look in the mirror sometimes with so many scriptures posted on the mirror. It's like every morning, riding to school, pull out the scripture and just, and just read it. Just the word speaking all the time in my life. And, and, and even when I wasn't going the right direction, that word was put in there. Thank you, mama, for doing that. Come on, my mother's here this weekend. Y'all give it up for my mom. She had a promise that my kids are gonna serve the Lord. And so when she was afraid that it wasn't gonna happen, she was holding on to the word anyway, kept speaking it. And that, that scripture, it said there, you gotta meditate on it day and night. You gotta think about it. You gotta, you gotta keep it in your heart. That word meditate, it's almost like putting it in a crock pot and just kind of let that stuff sit in you. You gotta think about it all the time. There should be scriptures all over your car, all over your house, everywhere you go. Quit looking at social media and turning on the news and start putting on the word of God in your life that'll build faith rather than fear in you. And by the way, there's a young lady in our church who had a skateboarding accident just two weeks ago. Our CFO, his daughter, and she fell on a skateboard and busted her head wide open. She was in, in North Carolina and uh, in the emergency room, went, went to Wake Forest Hospital for the trauma unit. And I'm just here to tell you her brain, the, brain, the bleeds and the, the problems, they didn't know whether she was even gonna live. And I'm just gonna tell you, we just keep obeying the word, finding God's promises, speaking his promises over her, meditating on those promises. And can I tell you, every day that girl has begun to make progress. In fact, she's standing up and she's walking around and she's coming home on Tuesday. Would y'all stand up and give God some praise for some of that? Woo! Yes. Yeah, come on, church.
And so I don't know what is in front of you that you're afraid of, but I'm just here to tell you, you, you got to understand that it's about God. It ain't about you. It's about his name being glorified. It has nothing to do with you. And if God can't use you, he'll use somebody else. But God's going to use people, but it ain't about people. It's about him. And then you got to hold on to God's promise. And you got to be responsible for that promise with the premise, obeying, speaking, and thinking. And then people. Boy, this is so important. You need to have the right people around you. Let's go back to our verse. Joshua in verses 10 and 11. So Joshua then ordered all the officers of the people, hey, go through the camp and tell the people, get ready. Everybody say, get ready. Three days from now, we're gonna cross the Jordan and we're gonna go to take possession of the land that the Lord your God has given you for your own. And they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses, we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. I'm just gonna tell you, you gotta have the right people around you. This world is full of negative people. And I, is, is anybody here like hanging out with negative? No, exactly. In fact, I'm in the store sometimes and I see negative down that aisle and I go, ooh. <laughs> we don't need pasta that bad. How am I gonna have faith when I got fear and negativity all the time around me? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have people that you can go to and say, man, I'm concerned, but just don't spew that stuff all over the place. You need to have some people around you that'll say, I hear your circumstances, but God. Come on, everybody say, but God. That's the kind of people you gotta have around you. Look, there's been too many times in the history of this church where I was ready to quit. Just problems. I think about building our first building here at our East Bainton campus, we were doing portable church for seven and a half years. We were meeting at Freedom Elementary School. We, when we went, that's where Hale Middle School's at the front, Freedom's behind it. We decided when we got to Hale, we was gonna keep going, we're gonna get to Freedom. <laughs> we actually did have Easter service one weekend in Hale. It's like we the only church ever brought Easter to Hale. <laughs> it was revival. People got saved. It was snatching people right out of Hale. Come on, somebody. <laughs> But we, we were doing portable church and we were trying to build a building. It was in 2008. Remember the financial collapse in 2008? We lost our financing. All we had was dirt. And they said, yeah, you were approved, but we ain't got your money anymore. And I was so ready to quit. You know, I had people that surrounded me, my own team. I told them, I said, man, y'all, I just am, I'm, I'm discouraged today. And then they just started speaking life over me and reminding me of God's promises and what he had done and the people that had been healed and the miracles that God has already done. And the more they talked to me, the, all of a sudden I was like, yeah, I got my swag back, man. I was like, let's go, let's go. And then and three weeks later, God somehow brought us some more financing and we built that building. And it ain't, ain't stopped since then. Well, that's not true. Because you know what? The devil, he's not a quitter but he is a loser. And in fact, this last year with all the COVID stuff, you know, I love people with all my heart. And so when you love people a lot, then people hurt a lot. And, uh, and so I was, I was ready to quit just all the COVID stuff and all the complaining. And I'm not talking about anybody specific. I was just ready to quit. You know what? I had some friends around me and say, Randy, it's okay. What God has taken you through in the past, he'll take you now, and you just keep the promise of God that you're gonna make it hard for people to go to hell, and you're gonna make a difference. You're gonna possess that land. It doesn't matter what the yin yin says. Just keep going after God. And I'm here to tell you now, God is faithful in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me get to where I wanted to take you today. You know, all that was just set up for what we're getting ready to talk about. I want you to write this down. Prioritize God's presence. Because listen, if you're gonna have the right perspective and you, you, you're, you're going to hold on to God's or recognize God's promises and you're gonna hold on to the premise and you're gonna have the right people around you, there, there needs to be a, an atmosphere of faith that you can live in. And yes, it comes from people, but I'm telling you, there is nothing like the presence of of God. That's what God told Joshua. Let's go to our last couple of verses here. Now we're in Joshua 3 when they're getting ready to cross over into the promised land, cross the Jordan. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, 
the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they went ahead of them. Now the Jordan was at flood stage all during harvest, yet as soon as the priest that were carrying the ark, that they reached the Jordan. Their feet touched the water's edge. The water upstream, in some translation says, it piled up in a heap. I'm just here to tell you right now, when the devil comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard and he'll put the devil in a heap in Jesus' name. This river was at flood stage, y'all. This was the worst time to cross the Jordan River. Some people's theologians would say it could have been a mile wide and 100 feet deep. They should have waited for a different time, right? There's no wrong time with God because they put the Ark of the Covenant out front. Come on, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Come on, you know. (laughs) That the Ark represented God's presence. That's where the law was. That's where his presence was. That, That represented God. And they sent that ahead. And when you send God's presence as a priority and you're like, God, I'm gonna make that a priority, then God will just open up opportunities where there are no opportunities. But you've got to learn how to practice God's presence. Look, the scripture says that the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what mountain's in front of you right now. But when God's presence shows up, it just changes everything. Never forget when I was a little kid. I was probably eight years old or so. And uh, it was a spiritual attack on our family and on myself. And I was having all kinds of nightmares and seeing demons and demonic things, and it was awful. And, uh, and I remember my, my mom, I was running fever. The doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. It was a demonic thing. And I remember my mother just singing these songs. There was an old song back in the day, Satan, I command you in the name of the Lord to take up your weapons and flee, for God has given me the victory to walk all over thee. Come on, somebody. And she would just sing that. Over and over and over again, and it was in that presence, in the presence of God, through worship, that things began to change, and that victory came, prioritizing God's presence. How do you overcome fear? You're going to have to figure out ways to prioritize his presence. And Franklin, would you come out here with me for just a moment? Come on, y'all give it up for Franklin. He's our East Bradenton worship director. Man, he makes me look bad. Look at Go on back in the back, Frank. I don't know. <laughs> so everybody listen up. Whatever ca- campus you're at, wherever location you're at, I need everybody's attention because this is so important. I'm getting ready to teach you something that is gonna be so important for you overcoming the fear of failure and it's prioritizing God's presence. I want you just to be quiet for a moment. Everyone, please, just for a moment, wherever you are. And I want you to take note of the atmosphere in the room where you are. Just, just sense it and feel it. Okay, now I wanna show you how the atmosphere can change. Franklin, would you begin to play something, play the keys there, would you? the difference in the attitude and the atmosphere just simply by putting worship in it. Let, let, me, let, me, let me take it a step further. Hold on one, for a second, Franklin. Listen, I could tell you that I know you're facing some difficulties. I know there's mountains that are before you, maybe beside you and behind you. But if I just tell you, look, turn your eyes on Jesus, quit looking at your problems, Turn your eyes on him. And the problems in this world, they begin to dissipate when you look fully in his wonderful face. That's great. That's the word of God. But what happens when we turn it into worship? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Things of earth will grow. 
grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for bad news for you first. You can't take Franklin home with you. I know that's a bummer, right? Okay. But it isn't Franklin. It's the prioritizing of God's presence. Every one of you chose to still all the problems in your life and focus and make God's presence a priority. And that's what changed things. It was not Franklin. Remember perspective. It ain't about a person. It ain't about you or someone else. It's about God. And when we prioritize that, the atmosphere and things begin to change. I told you when I was a kid what my mother taught me about worshiping God and prioritizing his presence, and it literally changed the atmosphere and the oppression that I was facing overcame because God's presence showed up and the problems melted like wax because the presence of the Lord was there. I've seen that happen in my life over and over and over again. Amy and I practice that on a regular basis. And so all I want you to understand here today is that I know you're facing problems, but I'm telling you, your perspective changes when you prioritize God's presence so you can see the promise, hold on to the promise, have the right people to build your faith so God can finish what he started because he always completes what he starts in Jesus' name. Would you stand on your feet and lift your hands to the Lord wherever you are? And I want to pray with you. God, thank you for these people. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord wherever you are unless you're driving, okay? Lift your hands to the Lord. And would you, just, would you just surrender to him right now, whatever the problem is, whatever the mountain that's before you, and would you make a decision right now? God, we turn our eyes towards you. God, that is where your glory and your presence, that's where it is. And so, God, we prioritize that. And so I pray that you would give us faith and give us the right perspective, God, and let us understand that your promises are yes and amen, God. You're always faithful to them. And God, as we stand on those and we surround ourselves with the right people who will say, whatever you say, I'm with you. God, that you indeed will show yourself to be true and you'll accomplish all that is in your heart for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God some praise for what he's done?